The revival is taking place in Australia. It is. We're praying for it. And I believe God's saying, don't pray for it anymore. You're in it. You're in it. Now do something. And, and I feel... I feel so stirred by this message. You know, it was a God-given message. I woke up on Thursday morning from a dream with a sermon and three points, and I've never, it's never happened to me ever. And I went, what the heck is this message? And um, it's such a God message because we're, we're in revival. We're in this moment. And God is saying, hey, put your name into this box and go, hey, do you want to miss out on what I'm doing in Australia? Because that's up to you. If you choose to partner with me with what's one going on, or you wake up one day and went, wow, I was a part of something that phenomenal that took place in Australia, but I decided not to be a part of it because of offense, because of hurt, because of jealousy, whatever it is. Hey, church, as your pastor, can I just say, get on board with what God is doing. Run our race. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Don't look at what these guys are doing. Don't look at what they're doing. Don't look at what I'm doing. Look at what you are doing what God has asked you to do, the lane he's asked you to race and just go for it with all you got and you will not miss out on what God is doing because I don't want to wake up one day and go, I missed it. I missed the revival. We're in it. So you're going to come with me? Are we in this together? You guys are amazing. All right. So as you can tell, I'm a little bit excited. I've had enough coffee and I think I'm excited because this message, it's challenging to me and it's causing me to shake up and move on. And I pray that this message shakes you up, you know, that shaking of the tree, and kicks you out that tree and goes, I'm ready to go for it. Have you ever thought to yourself, though, this, this kind of a question, have you ever asked this question, why am I not where I should be? Whatever stage of life, have you ever thought, man, I should be here, but I find myself here. I, I'm not where I want to be. I know I'm not where we should be, but I find myself I feel like I'm stuck in a moment where I'm just mm, waiting to project myself forward. You know, as a church, I feel like, man, I can get so like anxious and go, man, we should be packing this place a hundred times. We should be doing this. We should be doing that. And, 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 And I'm always wanting the more. Is anyone knowing what I'm talking about? Always feeling this. I'm not where I should be, but why am I there? Is anyone else feeling like that or just me? It's, almost, it's, it's a little bit like the kingdom of heaven. You, you know, we walk in, like the Bible says, the kingdom of heaven is here now, but it's not yet. It's still coming in full, but it's here. It's this, it's this paradox. It's this, I'm here, but I'm not where I need to be. I'm here, but I'm not where I need to be. Last week, Nathan kicked off, without even knowing it, a series, um, which I'm going to claim now to be called The Seasons in Life. So, his phenomenal message last week. He talked about the cloud and God's covering, and he, and he took the children of Israel out, and it was a phenomenal message. But what he did, he started a chain reaction without even knowing that God is God is God moved them from Egypt to somewhere. And can you imagine in what should have been an 11-day process that took 40 years to happen, what would be going on in their minds? Why aren't we there yet? What is going on? Why am I still stuck in the same old, same old, not knowing that their what's next, that their next place was only 10, 11 days away. But because of their attitude, because they didn't know the season they were in, it took them 40 years and a generation missed exactly what God had for them. They didn't realize the season they were in. And we need to wake up and realize the season I am in today. And that's where I want to go. The title of my sermon this morning is The Now and Not Yet. Say with me, The Now and Not Yet. It's finding yourself in the process. I'm here, but I don't, but, 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 but I'm not where I want to be. I'm here, but I feel like I'm in the wilderness. I'm here. I'm here in the now and the not yet. And in this process, God is wanting to shape you. God is wanting to do something within here so you're ready to take the not yet place. Is this all right? I need you to be um, a a bit talkative with me, you know. Nathan says when I speak, when he spoke, everyone quiet out. When I speak, I need you to speak. Draw it out because you're in, you're engaged. All right, we're going with me. So, 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 come on. So in the now, he's setting you up for the what's to come. I, I, I love FIFA 19. And um, for those who don't know that, it's a soccer game. I will be the FIFA 19 champion in GGC Live Church. I have declared that on Facebook. So I'm going to spend hours on this game, babe. Is that okay? She's saying yes, don't do the dishes. But you know in FIFA, any fifa Alex out there? In FIFA, I love, I love um, going in from the side and, and 
you know, scoring the goals, you come in from the side and you cross it in and you're waiting for someone. You're setting up a goal and, and it's a setup. And the guy comes in, he heads it in or he hollers it in and it's a goal and you cheer. But the worst is, is when you're playing with two people, like not against them, but on the same team. So it'd be like me and Nate. And then like, I'm like running up the side and I want to set it up in the middle. But Nate has not understood that what I'm doing is a setup for victory and he wants to go ahead before the setup has happened and he misses the opportunity to score and we don't win the game because he missed his opportunity, the setup. And God is saying, hey, church, GGC Life, I'm giving you a setup. Don't rush ahead for what I'm doing in the now because you need the now to score your victory, your goal. And that's where we're going this morning. My, my son and my, my kids love the Hungry Caterpillar book. Any parents know what I'm talking about? One, cool. Any kids love the book? Um, I wasn't allowed to read it as a kid. I don't know why. I didn't know what the caterpillar does until I was in year 12. No, kid. Anyway, so, so <laughs> I love you, Mom. And um, so Judah brings, uh, Judah brings this story, and they're understanding that there's this concept that happens in it with the caterpillar, and we all know what's going on here. It, last week at Kids, I love our Inspire Kids team because God is so moving in that ministry. My son comes to me with a, with a little cocoon. He goes, Daddy, Daddy, watch this. He put the caterpillar in there into this slot, and then when you open it up, it's gone, and it's a butterfly. You see, they're understanding that this is a transforming process that takes place in the unseen world, in this cocoon, where God is wanting to change what was into what is, but we want to go to what is without knowing what was to transform that, and we want to do it in our own power. We want to do it in our own way, and God's like, I need to put you in this cocoon. I need to take you in the now so I can shape you. I can transform you. I can mold you. I know I'm speaking about it, but someone needs to hear. If you're in the now, He's shaping you for a reason. He's setting you up for a win, not a fail, because our God is a good God who loves us. Amen? So I'm passionate about this, of course, because I find myself that all the time. We're about to go into the where, where God, I find myself in this place. Like as a pastor, I want so much more. And God is like, son, just, just wait. I've got it. But you haven't dealt with this. You haven't dealt with this. I need you. So this is for me. This is for you. This is for me. So we're going to look at three stages that must take place in the now so we can be ready for the not yet. So the first stage we want to look at is our testing ground. And this is where our faith is stretched. In the now period, you can go through an area where you're tested like absolute anything. Your faith is being stretched in this, in this waiting period. And God is saying, hey, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you love me? Do you know that I have something for you? In this moment, you're going to go through some stuff where your faith is going to be stretched. And we're going to turn to Genesis 39, if you will. And we're going to look at a man called Joseph and how he went through a testing ground. So we go 39, 11. But one day... When he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was, with, was there in the house, she, Potiphar's wife, caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand, and he fled and got out of the house. Can I put a pause right there? You know, it's really interesting that he was caught in a sticky situation where, where, where this, was, this is a perfect opportunity that, that sin grabbed him. And you know what he did? He didn't play around with sin. He didn't just flirt with sin. He ran out of there to the point where I just closed my Bible, where he left. He left her. He left his garment. I'm running out of here in my boxer shorts. And some of us need to run away from situations that want to take us out of the will of God. But what happens is he, 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 he runs out, and I, I've lost it. He runs out, and then and Potiphar comes home. And Potiphar's wife's like, see, your servant, the man you brought in, he has laughed at us. And, and it says, this Hebrew um, has been brought to us to make sort of us. He came in here to sleep with me. And she is accusing him of rape. And then, but I screamed, wow, you guys are on fire at the back there. Kick, kick over to the next one. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside him until his master came home. And then she told him this story. And then we see that he's telling the story and we can stop from there. But you see, Joseph from the very beginning was destined for greatness. He was called. He had a dream. He was the favored child. He was chosen to be ruler. He had this prophetic call. 
that he would rule over. But through trials and hardships, he makes his way, he gets sold, he makes his way to the head honcho in Potiphar's house. And then all of a sudden, accused of rape, he finds himself in prison. I don't know about you, but in the now, if you know the not yet is to have authority and ruler over all and you find yourself in prison, isn't that the furthest place from where God has called you, you feel like? Like you're stuck in this, like you're stuck in this prison. And, and I love this because Joseph, jo- Joseph doesn't, he doesn't waver in his faith. It actually strengthens him. He goes from son to slave to prisoner and he never allowed the circumstances to weaken his faith. Can I encourage you for a moment? You know, the prison was a setup for what God wanted to do in Joseph. Sometimes our circumstances, they look like an entrapment. And so God, the enemy has got me and he's entrapped me. And God says, I use all things for good for those who love me. And he uses it to set you up if you don't miss the moment in your circumstances. If you don't go back and go, I can't walk into the promises because I'm stuck in prison. You know, he had a calling to be um, to, to have authority over people. And while he's in prison, he got an opportunity to have authority over people. But most of us miss that and go, that's nothing. No, 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 no. Take this opportunity, walk into it, and I'm about to set you up for where you need to be. Yeah, things might come against you. Things might try and imprison you. It's the testing ground. And and this is the part where we go, God, I don't know what's going on, but I'm trusting you in the moment. You see, can I share a bit of an example in my life? That I, I, was, I went from um, situation to situation. I found myself in this warehouse. I'm in a truck and auto part warehouse. Like, I'm a, I, don't, I'm not, I don't like trucks and cars, and I don't know what, like, anything in that department is. I'm not that wide. And I'm in this place, and I find myself going, God, I know where I'm meant to be. I'm not there yet. I'm in the now, and I hate it. What am I doing here? And God's like, hey, you know what? Don't allow this situation to rule who you are. You can walk into the promise or you can choose to walk away. And then this guy comes into my life. He doesn't know Jesus. He knows nothing about Christ. He opens this door for me to speak Jesus, to me to speak life into him. He starts to learn about Christ. What is he doing? God is setting me up for what I'm meant to do. I could have missed it, but I walked in it. I walked in it. Can you imagine if I walked away and just went, no, this is not where I'm meant to be. And I just gave up. Never know where I would have. Never know if I would have been brought here. I would have missed the cloud. See what the Bible does not tell us, though, in his life, is the days and months when nothing happened in Joseph's life. He was there for a couple of years. Theologians speculate about two years in jail. Two years, and we read a few accounts. It seems like he was there for a month. In two years, nothing went by. Circumstance didn't change. What kept him? His trust. His faith was strengthened. Sometimes we're in a situation where we feel like, man, I'm in this, I'm in this situation. I'm not meant to be here. God, I need to hang on to you. And sometimes we need to go back into our journals, back into the promises that God has spoken over our lives, hold on to them, start declaring them, start claiming them. Why? Because when nothing else is speaking life into us, I need to move my lips that God gave me with the breath in my lungs to start prophesying over my life what God has told me that's going to happen. So if that miracle is not taking place, you continue to speak over it. I'm not seeing it. Speak, speak, keep declaring until you see it. Because if you don't, you're going to be sidetracked and take you out. You know, I was um, investigating this, and I read the account that Genesis has an interesting structure attached to it. I got this from uh, Desiring God, John Piper. Phenomenal, phenomenal. And I just want to show you the breakdown of the book of Genesis. So in the book of Genesis, the uh, creation account covers 3% of the book. Adam to Abraham, about 15. Noah to Abraham is about 21. Isaac is 8%. Jacob's 23. But Joseph's life, nearly 30, 30%, the majority of the book of Genesis is based on Joseph's life. And I was intrigued. I went in. I read the chapters. I was like, wow. It's all, what? I didn't, thought it only went for one chapter, just the prison parts. all we ever think. And then I started reading and said, Joseph had a unique role to play in redemptive history. But God's intricate involvement, hear me out, in his life 
is not unique to ours. The, that one of the many reasons God gives us a close-up of Joseph's life is to show us that in every circumstances, God is there. In the good, in the evil, He is there. What's our perspective on what we're going through? He's there. Like, He's there with you. If you can't see Him, find Him. Search for Him. He's waiting for you to go hold of Him. You, um, yeah. We see Paul in 2 Corinthians 1.8. We want to take some notes to 9. This is Paul, and he's speaking to the Corinthian church, and he said this, For we don't want you to be unaware, brothers. Hear the cry of his heart. Hear, hear the emotion. He goes, For of the affliction we experienced in Asia, we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired for life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. He's just saying it was hard. I felt like I was dying. I, I felt like this is the, like, you put yourself in that position. Sal, you have no idea what I'm in right now. I, I, I feel like I can't break through. And then he turns around and he goes, but, everyone say, but. That was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He understood that I need to put my trust and faith in God when all hell breaks loose, when everything seems like absolute nothing is happening. And that's something my, my wife and I have had to do. When my son was born, most of you know this story. He was born with my crochet. He has um, pretty much no E and no E canal. He's just got a bit of skin hanging on his head. He can't hear out of it. And, and, and that moment, I have to turn around and go, I don't know why. I don't know what is going on. I, I don't know what you've planned. Why? But God, but God, your grace is God. Your miracle is there. I'm believing for your healing and I'm going to attain for it until I see it. That is faith being strengthened. Not witnessing a miracle straight away, you know, because sometimes we see, why doesn't God just speak and show me? And then, because that's a moment, but God wants to change the process in my heart where I'm always relying on Him. Number two. I told you I get pretty passionate about this. In the now, it's our preparation ground. This is where kings are formed. This is where kings and queens, kings are formed. This represents our calling. Everything you do in our preparation ground is going to either set you up for your calling or it's going to hold you back from what God has for you. So we talked about our faith. Now we're going to have a look at our preparation. And we're going to look at a man called David. I love this little man. So let me, let me paint a picture right now. The prophet, the man of God, he's going to anoint a new king. Because, um, you know, Saul, he had his moment. He didn't really shine up to him. Anyway, um, so he's like, I've got to find a new king. So he goes, he goes to Jesse's house, and he's looking, for these big, he, he's looking for the next king. And Jesse goes, hey, here are my brothers. And he points out the biggest guys in, in the family, these brothers. He's pointing out Tanaka. He's pointing out Clement. Any of the big, strong, muscly men out here, you want to put your hand up? He's pointing, he's pointing to Ernest is trying to hide. He's pointing to all. And he's like, he's like, hey, this is, God, is, is it one of these guys? And he goes from, from one son to one son to one son. And he's like, no, nah, it's not happening. Hey, do you have another? And then he's like, and, and Jesse's like, actually, I do. I got Sal at the back, the small little guy at the back. Um, may, maybe it's him. And he goes, yo, bring him out. Bring out this little guy, Sal. And then, then Sal walks out and says, man, he ain't so little. He's actually quite big. What are you talking about? And <laughs> drop the mic. I'm not dropping the mic. And, and, and it's insane to think, why did he pick Sal? Well, I, I need a king who's going to rule, and there's nothing wrong. But, but God goes, hey, man, I'm not looking at what's on the outside. I'm not looking. I'm looking at what's on the inside. I'm looking at the heart. And this guy is a man after my own heart. So this is where we find the story, right? And in and, and, and 1 Samuel 16, that's where he says, I don't look at outwards. I look at the heart. But you see, it was his attitude in David, in the unseen realm, that actually pro propelled him for his future. See, it was what he did in the unseen. The best thing about David is when he was anointed king, I'm anointed king. He's come and put the, hey, man, he's laid hands. In my mind, hey, you've told me I'm going to be king. Take me to the palace. 
I'm ready to go. I got my bags packed. I'm ready to do this. Teach me all you need to teach me. I'm ready to take it. How many times when someone goes, hey, you know what? You're going to be a leader and you are going to be, you're going to be an evangelistic tool in the church. You're going to reach, you're going to speak. You're going to prophesy. You're going to see salvations. That's the man I see in front of me. And that's not hype. That's actually truth. I see an evangelistic spirit in your heart. Someone who gathers and someone who builds up people. I want to prophesy that over you. But see, this is what we tend to do. We hear this word and we go, okay, give me the mic. Give me the mic. David shows a perfect example. He went back to the sheep because it was in the, in the sheep pen. It was in the mundane. It was with, in the setting up the chairs and putting out the flags is where he learned his greatest lessons that would actually cause him to have his greatest battles in life and victories. And I want to show you. So two thoughts about David real quick. One, his preparation took place in the unseen. It was in the unseen. It's when no one was looking. And what did he do in the sheep pen? He was obedient and faithful to what God had called him to do. So some of us are waiting for the next word. Hey, man, what's the next thing, God? How about the last thing I told you? I'm not saying that to you. I'm just saying. <laughs> I was talking to the guy next to you. In the <laughs> but hey, I remember me as a connect group leader when I first came here. I had a connect group of three people, and I was like, God, I just want the, I want the pulpit. I, I, I want this. I want this. And he's like, what about your three? No, it was my heart. And I learned a valuable lesson is I'm never, ever too good and too big for the three. I will vacuum. I will set up. I will put those flags out. I will do whatever it takes. Why? <laughs> I'm always talking about those flags. I hate them. <laughs> I do everything unto the Lord. Hey, hey, hear me out. He went back and he did something. He fought in, in his obedience. He came across a lion and a bear. See, too often, camera guys, you got to love me when I walk. <laughs> too often, I sit here and I want to hear the preacher talk about my Goliath. Yeah, man, bring on Goliath. You know, I get up and you can take on your Goliaths. Yeah, all you need is a couple of rocks and God on your side. You can take off the giants in front of us and you're all cheering me down. You're like, yeah, Bible's in the air, standing on the chairs. Pre preach it, Sal, preach it. But most of us don't even hit the giants in our lives because we haven't been bothered with the bears and the lions in the secret place. You, we want to fight our giants, but we haven't done the bears and the lions. And the moment we see these giants, too big, I'm out of here. I don't want to set you up for fail. If you want to take the giants in your life, go back and go after the bears and the lions. Because if you can't take on the lion and a bear, how the heck are we taking on our giants? And that happens. That all happens. Where are my bears and lions? In your prayer closet. Behind closed doors. When no one is watching. Because the giant, that was in front of everyone. The bear and lion, that was in front of Jesus. Amen. See, it's the battles no one sees. Hear this. It's the battle no one sees in your life that prepares us for the victories everyone notices. Don't go for the victories. Go for the battles no one sees. Because it's not about what man thinks or what man sees. It's about what God does. And in the now, I'm not missing out on what he has the second thing that happens is that his character was challenged in the unseen. So it's David anointed king, and Saul is not happy with this. Saul's like, I don't like you. You are actually rising up above ranks, and this is my job. This is my position. I'm going to come out and kill you. Hey, can I throw this out there? Can I step on your toes for a minute? I'm just going to step on because I've already stepped on that. I'm just going to continue stepping. But you know what? So many times as Christians, we see other people raise up and start to become amazing people. And all of a sudden, <laughs> get up here. <laughs> He's my best friend. I can do this. But hey, we, 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 we see other people come up and start preaching better than us, start leading better than us, start doing life better than us. And God's anointing this man. And we can become a sore where I'm like, no, I don't want it because if God's on your life, that means I can't be used. So I want to start pulling Nathan down back to my level. And guess what happens? Come down, bro. 
But you see, when I pull Nathan down, I go down with him and we don't accomplish anything. But when I start pulling Nathan up, guess what happens? I rise up to the level. Go sit down, champion. But Saul didn't have that. If we don't realize this in our lives, we become the Saul's to our David's. We become that jealous person that, oh, why does, why does this guy get the chance and I don't? You know what? I think if Saul's attitude was so spot on, running his race, that God had set before him, God used both men in different ways. God wants to, my heart, as one of the pastors here, is to raise up as many leaders as I can. I'm going to pull you up. I'm going to pull you up. And I want to pull you up and excel you better than me. Why? Because we need everyone growing to the next level to move this mission forward. The last thing the world wants to see is Christians hating on each other, barking down on each other. I'm better than you. You're better. At the end of the day, I'm going to heaven. God's not going to say, hey, man, did you run Nathan's race? He's like, man, did you run the race I called you to win? You might have wanted to do that, but I've called you to do this. I haven't graced you for that. I've graced you for this. The moment you start wanting to do that, under God, not under God's grace, not under the covering in the cloud, you do it on your own strength. Why isn't this working? Why am I always angry? Why does this frustrate me? Why do I hate people? Hey, you know what? Get under the cloud. Get back under the covering and run your race. Your character's going to be built. And in the moment, that was not even part of my sermon, but um, it was all about Saul and David. David's about, he had the opportunity there's a moment, if you read in, in, in 1 Samuel 24, 1 to 8, write that down. It's very important. Because this is, he's in a cave, and he's got Saul. His, his men have found him. And there's, there's Saul, the guy who's meant to kill him. He hates him. He's there. And the Bible says he went to relieve himself. Literally caught him with his pants down. <laughs> the most vulnerable position any man can be. You're in no use when you... So, and he's... His pants are down. And his eyes are like, yo, oh, you're not David, you're too big. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, come on, bro. Hey, man, I love using people. This guy's a legend, man of God. Hey, bro, you are a teacher of the word. I just want to, honestly, man, I love that um, what you teach is honest truth. And I believe that uh, God is wanting to elevate something in here. And it's not going to be what you say. It's got what, you, what you're going to impart into people. Yeah? Just continue being faithful in the now. And uh, yeah, man, I'm crazy nervous to learn from you. You're amazing. But I go to David. Hey, David. Hey, David. This is your chance. Kill him. Kill him. He's there. He's there. And, and, and David turns around and goes, I will not touch the anointed one. I will not lay a hand. Even though he had every right, almost, under God's eyes, no right. Yeah. Sit down, bro. And I'm not going to tell you, have you been in that position? Because no, I don't think anyone in this room has been in a position where they eh, you can kill the person. <laughs> but when's the last time you put in a position where a leader stuffs up in church? Makes it, I, you know, I didn't make a call. I, I didn't say, whatever. It's like, hey, Sal didn't do that best day. Or what about Sal lately? He's not, all of a sudden, what are you going to do? Are you going to slag on that leader? Because what we do in the unseen our character is either developed or it's going to be brought down. Can I tell you why? Because it happened to me. I was hanging out with one of the guys in this church, and then all of a sudden a leader, because we're not perfect people, and one of our leaders was like not performing their best, and I was like, oh, yeah, what's with that, eh? Rah, rah, rah. And you know what? The guy was like, man, really? Is that how you talk to about that person? It just shot me in the heart. My character was all of a sudden tested, and I want to win this testing. So is that all right? It's in these moments we either build or we tear down our character. What are some of the battles within that you need to fight? What are some of the battles? All right, last point. Is this helping anyone this morning? Last point is this. It's our training ground. The now and not yet. I want to be there. This is exactly where God has called me to be. But I'm now. What am I doing? The third thing he wants to do, he wants to train us as warriors. See, our training ground are where warriors are built. And this represents our warfare. This is the part where we learn to fight when no one else is watching. And how do we do that? We go to Colossians 1. 11 to 12. And he's poor and he's praying over the Christians. He, he's praying over the church and goes, look, I pray that you'll be strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father. See, in our now and not yet season, we experience, in our wild, sorry, our wilderness experience, 
It's where we need to learn to build our muscle memory, if that makes sense. Yeah? Like muscle has a memory, faith has a ha, muscle. Muscle is, yeah, I don't, anyway. Uh, faith's like muscle. When you stretch a muscle to its points, actually builds and builds and builds. And our faith, God's, it, it, it's going to build and build and build. And I, I love this because we fight from a place of victory, not for victory. But it also says in 2 Timothy that we share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. You see, you're a soldier. Say, I'm a soldier. You know what happens to soldiers? They fight. They expect hardships in life. If you're a soldier, guess what? Opposition is coming your way. If we're in a revival and you've just said to me, I'm a part of it, guess what the enemy wants to do? He wants to go even more harder on you because he knows the calling on your life. So we need to, in the now, we need to be praying. We need to be digesting the Word of God daily. Not over a place where it's like I spend a whole day. It's every day consistently building. Do you know how I've been able to preach this morning? Like, I haven't spent all week, 10 hours, praying, praying. I just found out Friday afternoon. But it's out of this place of an overflow. You see, the Bible says, the Bible says you need to be in and out of season. Be ready. Not just to pre, not, don't just, but be ready. And God, how do you be ready? You just got to, in the now, know how to fill yourself up. This is where warriors, and we get strong, and we're ready to face the battle. This is where we do it. We don't do it in front. You know what? Victory shows up today. But it started when I started praying. It just showed up today. It's visible today. But that's because I did my training in the background. Ernest didn't walk into this building like a beefcake just because he showed. He, he, victory showed up that day, way, but it started back in the day. Because what happens when we're, when we're not well equipped to handle hardships? It's too hard. Not good enough. I can't take on the giants. I, get, I quit. We want the battlefield. We're in the training ground. It's in the process. Is this okay? I want to end with this. Or well, a bit more to go, but Philippians, Paul saying, he says, hey, be confident of this. I want to put you, if, you're, if, you, if you feel like you're in the not now, because you know we always go to the not now. Uh, can, can I just explain this for two seconds? Our not now is always taking place. This is what I mean. I'm in the not. I'm in the now. I'm not yet. And God is building me, equipping me, building me. All of a sudden, He elevates me. And now, I'm in. I'm in my promised land. I'm in. I'm in my. I'm in my place where I need to be. And I'm working. And I'm going for it. If you're in that season, rejoice. This is great. We're taking ground. But all of a sudden, God wants to go. Hey, I'm moving you again. You need to go. You need to go higher. That means you got to go back to the wilderness. Why is that? Because I need more things from you to learn. I need you to deal with other issues in your heart that you weren't ready for in the past season. Now you're ready. You got more things. And I find myself back in the same place, but different. He's always, it's a transformation process. We are being conformed, but it's a transformation. So if you're feeling that right now, I want to encourage you to this. Be confident of this. Say confident. confident. Say it with confidence. Confident. confident. Be confident of this. That he who began a good work in you will carry it out unto, to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Hey, he's going to carry it out. But you know what that means? You need to do your part. You can't just sit around waiting for God to do anything. You need to, that's right, you need to walk with Him. He's saying, hey, if you don't give up, if you continue moving forward, pressing in onto me, I'm going to make sure. It doesn't matter what. You can find yourself in a warehouse. You can find yourself in a prison. You can find yourself not even planted in the house, but you've called me to this. Whatever it looks like in your jobs, you might be filing cabinets, but you're meant to be, hey, whatever I started, I'm going to finish it if you don't quit. Too many of us quit before it even takes place to stay the course. It's like deal or no deal. You've got the million dollars in the, you've already got the million dollars in your case. Why quit for 30 bucks? Hundred dollars. Because you know you, the, the difference with that is you know you have it. Because he has promised it to you. He's just waiting for you to get to the rest of the round to finish. I started my year as a, been saved 15 years 
And my life verse was Matthew 6.33. You guys know it? What is it? I'm like, cool. You guys seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So I started my, my walk. Um, thank you. Seek first. And, and I've had this revelation that I want to finish strong. Yeah? And I want to prophesy this verse over you. Isaiah 40.31. Why don't you stand? I want to just share this over you. Close your eyes. But those who wait, those who wait, just wait on him. Those who hope, those who wait, those who don't give up, those who trust in the Lord, they shall renew their strength. If there's anyone tired because you're in the trenches, you're in the now, but not yet, and you're just tired, I'm just done. Wait on the Lord. You will renew your strength. You will soar on wings like eagles above the storms. You will run. You will not grow weary. You will walk and you will not be faint. The reason why media is so important to us is I believe the world, and especially the, the up and coming generation, everyone's on media diet. We're in it right now. We're riding the wave. The crest of the wave is upon the world. People live on media, but we need to communicate and use the language that people are talking. So in 1993, a man by the name of Vernon Falls stood us up in a, a group of about 300 people, and he prophesied over me and my wife that we would be on radio and TV ministry. And when he said that, I can't explain it any other way, but something exploded inside of me. You always sort of doubt yourself, is this from God? Is it for me? You know, am I just wanting to do this? When you haven't met someone before and he's from overseas and he speaks something so clearly what was in my heart, we were so excited because when that word came, it was such a confirmation of what God had called us to do. 1999, we started on radio. So we've been on radio ever since. 2012, God opened up the door to share the gospel on the Australian Christian Channel. And just recently, in the last couple of years, we've been on God TV across Australia, New Zealand and the islands. God has given us a creative team that we do short films, we write scripts, we tell stories. Testimonies, people's life stories, how God changed them. I have found the truth that I've been looking for. My mind was just taking control of who I was. I couldn't see a way out. The vision is large because we want to not just have short films, we want to get into movies eventually and impact people. That's our heart. We believe God's given us a mandate to share the good news of the Kingdom of God. Most of our films have gone viral and it's just exploding. So the reach is far. The door's wide open even right now with God TV, with the nations. The things that's stopping us is finances. We always want to present the gospel to people for free, but it does cost people money to produce these shows or films. If you guys feel in your heart to want to contribute monthly, whether it's $10 or $5, something small, whatever amount God gives you, it's going to help us get this gospel out to the nations. So I only encourage every one of you that might feel, you know, I believe in this ministry. I believe in the media. I believe the power of media. I believe in what you guys are doing. If you want to support us in any small way, we would love that. You can give or donate on the link below here. We want to say thank you and say that we can partner together with God to see this gospel of His kingdom spread to the nations of the world.